Right. Praise God. You guys, we have uh, our study in Proverbs uh, chapter 6. We were just looking at a few verses as we're looking at the seven deadly sins, and we move to a new one as we go through this series. And uh, we've covered a number of them. We're reaching the end of the series here. And if you look at verse 16, it says, There are six things which the Lord hates. He has seven which are an abomination to him. Haughty eyes. We looked at that. Haughty eyes. A lying tongue. Hands that shed innocent blood. A heart that devises wicked plans. We just had two messages on that. Uh, last week's message was how to control your thought life. That's very important. Uh, and then we see the very next thing in verse 18. Feet that run rapidly to evil. Feet that run rapidly to evil. And notice he's tying these sins into different parts of our human anatomy. And obviously here he moves to feet. And these are one of the things that the Lord God hates. Feet that actually run rapidly to evil. And living in uh, the greater Los Angeles area, just outside of Los Angeles County by a few miles, uh, we here in Southern California, most of you know that we live in uh, it, that L.A. is the uh, gang capital of the world, you know. Uh, and the Bible dresses gangs. The Bible talks about gangs. The Bible, uh, Jesus warned that uh, in the last days, he said, that nation would rise against nation and kingdom against kingdom. And uh, when we think of kingdom against kingdom and nation against nation, uh, you know, you typically think of nations at war and then kingdoms. And uh, it was in 1914 and then, uh, then the Second World War after that where we actually saw kingdoms world wars, where all kinds of nations joined together, and you saw kingdoms against kingdoms, and that wasn't typical in ancient days, you see, uh, but alliances of kingdoms against kingdoms, and that's how warfare has become more and more in the last century, uh, with ideologies that spread around the world and what have you. But when he said nation against nation, the Greek word nation is ethnos in Jesus' words, and ethnos is the Greek word from which we get our English word ethnic, He's literally saying ethnic group against ethnic group. And we see that uh, a lot of the gang warfare is basically... Uh, so when I look at that verse, nation against nation, I see it as uh, nations in our English, yes, definitely country against country, but, uh, which are usually made up of various ethnic groups. But also right within uh, you know, one city, you might see several different ethnic groups battling one another and each other as well. And Jesus said that that would happen and that it would actually get worse uh, until he came, and that's because the human heart can't be cured by government, you know? Human heart can't be cured by, uh, you know, by hum, hum, human reason or, or science. There's a, the fundamental problem, as we know, with man is not the economy, it's the heart. The heart gets right with God, and people everywhere sought God. Jesus said, seek first the kingdom of God and his righteousness, and all your needs would be met. But we have it backwards. We put things and, you know, before God and one another. And as Christians, we're, not in the, we're, we're in the world, but we're not of the world. Jesus said, I've chosen you out of the world. He said, my kingdom is not of this world. And therefore, we do seek first the kingdom of the Lord. He does take care of us. And, and we have love amongst us, you know. And we, we care and love for one another. And it's a, a beautiful thing. But uh, the world's just gone off the wall, you know. And feet run rapidly to evil. Morals have gone out the window. I mean, uh, people, young kids have been being taught for years now, as we know, that, you know, hey, there's no God. It's just all, it's a big accident. All this incredible design, you know, in your cells and your DNA and your eyes and, and your abilities and the five senses and the abilities to reproduce and all this stuff, a oh, big accident, just a big explosion, you know. And right now, I mean, they, they've spent hundreds of millions of dollars on building a new Capitol building, I don't know if you guys see any of the new pictures of the new Capitol building or footage of that. I mean, they spent hundreds of millions, way over budget, hundreds of millions of dollars over budget, okay, which is par for the course for, uh, uh, you, know, uh, you know, government, whether it's, that's a Democratic Congress, by the way, and it's also a Republican president, so it's both sides, you know, of the aisle have, you know, spent us to death. But I'll tell you what, uh, when you, the Capitol building, you know that our motto, which is supposed to be in our country, in God we trust, you know, that was shoved in a real obscure place and replaced with the motto, you know, e pluris, pluribus unum, which is not our, our motto officially, and that was put as our motto. And in God we trust, and Abraham Lincoln, where he, you know, the podium on which he, you know, swore in the Bible when he was inaugurated was there, but there was no Bible there, you see. The Bible he used, they took away. So God has been expunged from our nation, and then we wonder why the children have no morals and that, you know, these 
kids that grew up in the 60s and were taught, hey, you know, there's really, you could do whatever you want. They're the ones running government. They're the ones doing all these corrupt things. And we're running a lot of the cop corporations. Like, they have no morals. And we want to say, oh, well, we don't want people taught right from wrong. We don't want prayer in school. We don't want these kinds of things. And then we complain that the students who grew up under that kind of mentality are ripping us off left and right. And we say, how could they do such, th- you know, these things that are so wrong? Wrong? Wait a minute. What happened? What is right and wrong? We want there to be right and wrong when it affects us. But we don't want it to be taught. And then we wonder why those who aren't being taught these things and how they affect us later in life when they get these corporate positions and government positions, what happened? It's obvious what's happening. In fact, there at the Capitol building, there was, a, there was a manger scene. And the atheists said, hey, you know what? We want to be able to put our stuff up. So they put this statement up, you know, there's no gods, there's no, there's no devils, and, you know, uh, you know, religion enslaves the hearts of men and, you know, uh, minds of men and what have you, and... You know, and I thought, wow, that's funny, you know. When I came to Christ, I was set free. I used to be bound by, you know, sex, drugs, and rock and roll. You know, a pothead and, you know, uh, LSD and get drunk whenever I could all the time with my buddies. And I was lost and I was very destructive. I was a, a street brawler and I was the kind of guy that loved to just get in trouble. And, and I thought I was going to die young. Then I came to Christ and I woke up. I was like, what was I doing? And my life was set free. And I've been able to, by God's grace, to be a blessing to a ton of people and a ton of people. You guys and others have been a blessing to me and one another, you know? But uh, it's, it's remarkable to me because that's dangerous, by the way, to blaspheme God like that. I mean, you go through the scripture when people blaspheme God. Remember Belshazzar? Blaspheme God. And then, uh, you know, the words, Tekamani and what have you, were written on the wall by the hand of God. Your days are numbered. You've been waiting the balance. Your, day, your days are numbered. Boom, his kingdom was gone. Ananias and Sapphira mocked God, boom, they died right there. Korah was mocking God, and the ground opened up, man. It literally sucked him down and had him for lunch when he came against Moses. Oh, by the way, I heard one of the atheists that was part of the group that put that sign up at the Capitol building next to the nativity scene. And he was being interviewed on one of these, uh, I was driving down the road, you know, he flipped around to certain uh, news shows and what have you as I'm driving sometimes if I can't find you know, a, a good Bible teaching or what have you. And I think it was Medved, and he was inter- interviewing this, this guy about the sign they put up, and he was gloating about it. And then he asked about who wrote it and actually was the main person responsible. He said, oh, a, a lady that, you know, she did it, but after she did it, she died suddenly. And I was like, hello, you know, come on, wake up, you know. And you might say, hey, you know what, I've, I was against God. I'm not God. I'm still alive. Same here. Same here. I did before I was a Christian. I was very anti-Christ. I didn't even know why. I just mocked the Christian God. And the joke was on me, man. Satan was totally deceiving me. I woke up, came to the knowledge of truth. I was like, man, what an idiot I was, you know? But it was by God's grace that he didn't kill me when I could have been killed. And I deserved to be put to death because of my hatred for God, the creator, you know? Because the Bible says God will not be mocked. But the Bible also says he's patient. And Paul said he was patient toward him as the chief of sinners. But if God, you know, if there's a heart and God knows it's not going to turn to him, he can either take that person right then or he can let that person live out his life because God even uses the evil, the evil people that, that they do, God will use it for his glory in some way to show his power on the day of judgment like he did against Pharaoh when he judged him or in a myriad of ways. God always wins. So I have peace. I know God wins the whole deal at the end. Amen? So I have such peace in that. And how about you? A lot of peace there, knowing that God wins in the end. And that's, that's awesome, that he wins. But I thought, wow, how come it's not being reported in the media that the lady that was most responsible for putting this thing up just died right after that? Crazy timing, you know? And there's a lot of that through history when you, you look at significant things. Uh, just like studies, medical studies, on men that commit adultery, there's an inordinate amount of adult of heart attacks while they're in the midst of the act, just way above, you know, norm. Uh, well, interesting, you know. Oh, there could be medical reasons for that, I'm sure, but it's medical reasons of situations that probably happen because they're way out of the will of God. Be warned, men, right? Stay close to your wife if you're married, amen? Stay close to God. So we need to teach the difference between good and evil, and here we see one of the things God hates is is feet that run rapidly to evil. Amen? And in chapter uh, 1, we see a warning about joining gangs. And young people, man, 
you basically slit your own throat when you join a gang, okay? In fact, uh, look at what it says the first chapter of the book of Proverbs. Uh, the wisest man on earth at the time, Solomon, words from God inspired by the Lord God. He says, I think this is powerful. Verse 10, my son, if sinners entice you, do not consent. Sinners try to seduce you and running with them. Don't consent. If they say, come with us, let us lie in wait for blood. Let us ambush the innocent without cause. Let us swallow them alive like Sheol, even whole. As those who go down to the pit, we will find all kinds of precious wealth. We will, we will fill our houses with spoil. Throw in your lot with us. We shall have one purse. You know, we'll just be, we'll be a gang together, man. We'll have a, a little treasury and what have you. And my son, do not walk in the way with them. Keep your what? Feet from their path. In other words, don't run to evil. Don't run rapidly to evil. Keep your feet from their path. For their feet run to evil. And they hasten to shed blood. Indeed, it is useless to spread the baited net in the sight of any bird, but they lie in wait for their own blood. In other words, you think by dishonest gain, just like some of these corporate executives who've been ripping people off, and just like many people in the government who, who are beholden to lobbyists because they care more about patting their pocket than the people. And really what they're doing is they're putting the net around themselves. They're slitting their own throats. That's what I'm saying. I said earlier, same with young people. It's the same mentality. You really hurt yourself. The Bible says you bind yourself with cords with your own sin. You see, that's what being set free is. When you come to Christ, you're set free from the penalty of sin. You don't end up going to hell forever. That's really awesome, amen? You're set free from the bondage of sin, the enslavement to sin, and the guilt of sin because Jesus has washed your sins away. And then you have a new life. He gives you a new heart and you can live for him. Now, but they lie in wait for their own blood. Isn't that interesting? They're really lying in wait for their own blood. They ambush their own lives. Those who get engaged in wickedness are really destroying themselves. They ambush their own lives. So are the ways of everyone who gains by violence. It takes away the life of its possessors. Now, this is pretty heavy. Look at the rebuke God gives. Wisdom shouts out in the street. She lifts her voice in the square. At the head of the noisy street, she cries out. At the entrance of the gates in the city, she utters her sayings. How long, O oh, naive ones? Naive because they don't see the whole picture. Will you love being simple-minded and scoffers? These would be people that would mock God and, and make up their own rules to live by. And scoffers delight themselves in scoffing and fools hate knowledge. Turn to my reproof. Behold, I will pour out my spirit on you. I will make my words known to you because I called and you, what? Refused. I stretched out my hand and no one paid attention. And you neglected all my counsel and did not want my reproof. Look at what's going on there, guys. It's not that these guys are predestined unquivocally by divine fiat to eternal reprobation and, and damnation. God's reaching out his hand. He's saying, follow my reproofs. Come to me. But if they do not, and they rebel. Okay. And they become, they say, I'm going to be your enemy, God. God says, I also will laugh at your calamity. I will mock when your dread comes. Because he's God. And it's a sad joke what they're doing. And they're mocking, thinking they're bigger than God. And they're not God. And God's like, you're not God. You're like a little ant. You know, when your dread comes like a storm and your calamity comes like a whirlwind, when distress and anguish come upon you, then they will call on me, but I will not answer. Then they will seek me diligently, but they will not find me because they hated knowledge and did not choose the fear of the Lord. They would not accept my counsel. They spurned all my reproof. So they shall eat of the fruit of their own way and be satisfied with their own devices for their waywardness of the naive, the waywardness of the naive will kill them. And the complacency of fools will destroy them. But he who listens to me shall live securely and will be at ease from the dread of evil. And you know what? On the day of judgment, there'll be people, let us in, let us in, like the five unwise maidens we read about in Matthew 25. They'll still cry out to God when it's just too late. The day of grace is over. 
no more opportunity to get saved. And Jesus said, they'll be knocking, saying, let us in. And he'll say, I don't know you, depart from me. There comes a time where it's too late. And they'll be weeping, Jesus said, and gnashing of teeth. People will be crying and gnashing their teeth because of their hatred of what they've done. And when it comes to the knowledge that by running rapidly to evil actually brought forth their own destruction and their own stubbornness of heart kept them from the grace that could save them. Not that they deserve. We don't deserve grace. That's why it's called grace. We deserve death. That's why we all die. The Bible says the wages of sin is what? Death. And all of sin comes from God. Glory to God. So we all deserve this, this penalty of death. But it's God's grace that he offers to all indiscriminately because he so loved the world. Amen. That whosoever will may call upon him and be saved. But if you refuse to call upon him and partake of the mercy we don't deserve, which we should be so thankful for as Christians, God, you saved a sinner like me. And we refuse that grace. And we say, I'm going to run rapidly to evil. And you're plotting your mind, whether it's with a group of people or in your lonesome by yourself. You are plotting your own destruction. You're sowing the seeds. The Bible says, God will not be mocked, I mentioned earlier, but goes on to say, he that sows the flesh will of the flesh reap corruption. You reap what you sow. O.J. Simpson, man, thought he got away with murder. Well, he wasn't actually convicted of it. He was in the civil trial. He was convicted of murder in the civil trial. He just had to pay money, though. And he golfing all the time and laughing and, and what have you. And, and I don't know if you heard the tape. I heard a tape last night where he's laughing about selling all, or about giving all of his stuff away. When the Goldmans came into his home, he had given a lot of his memorabilia and what have you away. And he's laughing about it, saying... I, I, I gave it away to friends, right? And they came in and said, where is it? And he's laughing. He says, well, it's not here. It was taken and what have you. But he's, but he's telling the guy that's interviewing him that I really gave it to different people, you know, because I didn't want the Goldman's to have it because he slit, you know, Goldman's throat, you know, and the parents wanted some, rep- you know, re- some kind of justice and, and, of course, his wife's throat and what have you. And, and he's laughing about that. Yet, in the trial, he's sobbing, saying, I only wanted to get back what was mine. And they were saying it was never, they never took it. It was given to him by OJ. Guess what? The truth came out. I don't know if you've seen the tape. Yesterday, well, we we assumed this anyway, right? But he's admitting in an interview that was exclusively revealed last night. Right there in a video, he's laughing about how he schemed it all. So basically, he gave it to different people, but then he was trying to get it back after he gave it to them because he didn't want someone else to get it. It wasn't stolen. But you know what? The irony is, he didn't get what he deserved, got out of the murder trial. Rich people could do that, but they still get justice in the end. And now he's in prison for how many years? You know, potentially 33. But you know what? That's nothing compared to what's coming to everybody who rejects God and refuse to humble themselves and admit that they're sinners and admit they're wrong and say, God, have mercy on me. Because the Bible says, Jesus will say, go into the eternal fire prepared for the devil and his angels, and they will be punished for eternity. So I pray for OJ, but when I see the tears, part of my heart was like I felt so bad for the guy. Not because I believed his story when he was talking at the end, when I heard his testimony, but because I felt so sorry for him because he is so deluded by his own arrogance and his own pride. But OJ represents millions of people, many who haven't been caught, who are on their way to radical judgment who think they're getting away, golfing, and life's just going on. No, life is very, very short, you know? It's very short. The Bible says it's like a vapor. It appears for a while, then it's gone. We need to make sure we get right with God. The Bible says prepare to meet your God. You're not very smart or very wise if you're just living life and just going to end up in hell forever. You're smart, man. If you say, you know what? There's obviously a creator here that made me, and I need to answer to him, so I better find out what his will is before I step in to eternity, unless I do it without God. So it's important that we don't turn our feet to do evil. And it talks about people that run rapidly to evil, but, and we know the Bible forecasts it would get worse. Jesus said lawless, lawlessness would get worse and worse in the last days. Matthew chapter 24. 2 Timothy 3, Paul said evil men and seducers would wax worse and worse. Verse 13 of 2 Timothy 3. A few verses before that, verse 1, he says, know this, that, and you know this passage, he says, know this, that in the last days, terrible time will, will come, for men will be what? Lovers of their own selves. 
They'll be way in love with themselves, have a really high self-esteem. The problem won't be low self-esteem. It'll be just an infatuation with self. They'll be lovers of self. And guess what follows that infatuation, that high, too high of a, you know, way strong love of self. Lovers of self, it says, for men will be lovers of self, covetous, they'll be ripoffs. Thieves, you know, covetous, boasters, they'll be braggarts. Listen to the music today in our age. It's all braggadocia. A lot of the rap music and stuff, it's all about, look at me, you know, I'm, I'm killing cops and I'm raping girls and, and I'm doing drugs and I'm not getting caught. It's like, Whoa, man, this is the popular music and we're wondering what's happening to our society? Thousands of years ago, guys like Aristotle and Plato, you know, they said, hey, when the music becomes evil in a society, it destroys the society. And I don't care if you say, well, the heart, the music's a reflection of the heart or, the, uh, you know, the heart's a reflection of the music. I believe it works both ways personally. And it shows the hearts are messed up here in our world. And it shows also that mass people are getting influenced, by the way. That's, you know, that's why advertising companies, every commercial has a jingle. They, music affects people. Otherwise, these guys would be throwing their money down the drain. So there's a lot of, you know, the heart, it says, men will be lovers of self, covetous, boasters, proud. First thing on God's list, the proud, proud look, you know, proud, you know, boastful, proud, deceivers. It gives a huge list. Disobedient to parents, unthankful. It gives a huge list. But it's interesting what you see in the last days, according to the Apostle Paul, and think about this. What you see is rampant evil. But then he says in that same passage in 2 Timothy chapter 3, they'll have a form of godliness, but deny the power thereof. So what would you see? You would see rampant evil among the youth and, and, and in societies in the end times. But not just rampant evil. They would have a what? Form of godliness. Oh, I'm ethical, I'm moral. And they also would have high self-esteem. They think they're good still. And guess what? That's exactly, exactly what's happening today. And sometimes when I quote that passage, I just quote it to point out that, hey, you know, the scriptures say that the morals would decline rapidly in the end times. But I'm trying to draw your attention to something here. It's not just the moral decline of the nation and the world. It's with that moral decline, a high view of self, self self-love, it says, And with that high view of self-love and radical immorality, what? A form of godliness. People still believing that they were ethical and moral. And you know, that's exactly what's happening today. And it's because we've been taught all those things in our nation. We've been taught all those things in our nation. In fact, you know, I read a study recently. uh, I was looking at mental problems afflict one in five young adults. One in five mental problems and this was reported in uh, you know, health uh, uh, magazines and journals and what have you. Almost one in five young American adults has a personality disorder that, that uh, interferes with everyday life and even more abuse, abuse alcohol or drugs, researchers reported Monday in the most extensive study of its kind. The disorders include problems such as obsessive or compulsive tendencies and antisocial behavior that can sometimes lead to violence, the study also found that fewer than 25% of college-age Americans with mental problems uh, get treatment. In other words, they're seeing the problems get worse and worse. And sometimes when they seek treatment, it gets worse and worse with them as well. Not always, but sometimes they're told, you just need to love yourself even more. Well, guess what? A lot of times the problems because there's such a focus on self and not serving God and being a blessing to others. I told you... Uh, during a, a huge war in France, the study showed that when they went to war, guess what? The mental hospitals emptied. And uh, many believe that that study reveals it's because they got their eyes off, many of the people got their eyes off themselves and because they saw their relatives were going out to war and dying. And they started, they, and they got focused on something else rather than themselves. And all of a sudden, they, many of them were healed. Well, that's because a lot of our problems are narcissism. In fact, an inordinate amount of self-love and self-esteem used to be called narcissism. That's a medical that was a psychological term for, you know, excessive self-love. But we've been hearing that message in the schools now and in psychology for years. We need to love ourselves more. That's what's wrong with the kids. We need to tell them how incredible they are and how they need to do this and that for their lives. And a husband and wife go to marriage counseling. We want, like, we want our marriage to work out. We don't know what's going on. We don't want a divorce. That's why we're here. Well, ma'am, you know, you just need to focus on yourself more and love yourself more. 
And your marriage will get better. And sir, you need to just, you know, go golfing more and, and love yourself more. And guess what? They go home and they defend themselves even more. And they don't want to say they forgive me, I'm sorry, or I did something wrong even more because it's, I love myself. And all of a sudden, it's just, it's like throwing gas on a fire. The Bible says we need to deny ourselves and live for him, amen? And esteem others, the Bible says, higher, that's not me, that's the Bible. Esteem others higher than yourselves. Condescend to the man of the lower state and serve, the Bible teaches. Amen? We need to get our eyes off of ourselves. Oh, you know what? Another study I was looking at. And you know what? This uh, study is sad because, I mean, they're all sad. But you think of it, we're talking about things getting worse and, and worse and worse. But this is a, a survey that also came out last week. Two in three students cheat. One in three steal. I mean, think of the amount of children that is. When you think of millions and millions of children, two in three students cheat. One in three steal. Wow. It says, an anonymous survey of U.S. high school students indicates that trends are on the rise. In other words, it's getting worse and worse and worse. And I don't know how anybody can say things are getting better and better and better, and we're becoming more and more moral, and kids are more moral today. Give me a break, man. Give me a break. You know what? The study says nearly two in three U.S. high school students have admitted cheating on an exam in the past year. And early one, and you're really cheating yourselves. If you're a high school student and, and you're really faking, you know, you know, faking it the whole way through, and you know, you're not studying and what have you, you're really hurting yourself, you know? Uh, cheating on an exam in the past year. And nearly one in three have acknowledged stealing from a store in the past year. Now that's those who are admitting it. It's probably closer to half. One in three are admitting that they stole in the last year from a store. Okay? Now, according to the findings of an anonymous survey of nearly 30,000 American youths, it's a huge study. That means out of 30,000, 10,000 said, yeah, within the last year I ripped off a store. This is also contributing to the economic chaos and downfall of our nation, guys. There, people point out one or two things, man, but it is in the heart. It's our lack of morals. That's what's going on in our country right now. Let's pull our heads out of the sand and wake up and say, wow, because these kids grow up and they become who? The leaders in government. They become the leaders in corporations. And they're already used to ripping everybody off and for themselves, so many of them. And praise God, there are a degree of people that are interviewed that don't do those things. They're like, no. People, you know, people that have been raised to, to know the difference between right and, and wrong and see the big picture that evil doesn't pay off in the end. You know, there are many uh, that have come to Christ, that have turned to God, that fear him and seek uh, to do what's right. It says the survey by the jo uh, Josephson Institute of Ethics in Los Angeles also indicates that 83% of students admit that they sometimes lie to the parents about something significant. And, but now check this out. This was the kicker when I read this. But, that, but 93 are satisfied with their personal ethics and character. Over 90% believe they're good people. Almost 95%. That's almost 19 out of 20 of these kids said, I'm a moral person. Even though I lie to my parents, I cheat and I steal, I'm moral. I have a high view of my morals myself. Now, where does that come from? Put it together. Kids are taught. There's no difference between good, right and wrong. You came from slime. It's all a big accident. There's no real moral authority you have to answer to. You can make up your own rules. But you are a great person. You are a very good person, no matter what you do. You need to have a high view of yourself, a high self-esteem. And by the way, they found that, you know who has the highest self-esteem when they do uh, uh, one study showed? Those that are in the penitentiary. Huh. A very high few of themselves. Well, no wonder. They think so highly of themselves, they take everybody else's stuff or, or slit other people's throats, you see. And no wonder we're being taught these things. But guess what? They're finally finding out. And I've been warning, this, warning you about this for a long time. Over 20 years. Fellowship hasn't been around for 20 years almost, going there. But guess what? I've been, I've been warning you about the self-esteem movement here in California and elsewhere that is going to, it's part of, it's going to help breed a disaster well, guess what? This is WebMD, a study on WebMD. High self-esteem isn't always healthy. I'm glad you figured it out. Uh, this is from Science Daily. I was on the Science Daily site, and another article, high self-esteem is not always what it's cracked up to be. 
Well, that's again science finally catching up with the Bible, you know. But it's a bit late. I'm thankful that they're honestly admitting this in the medical community, in the scientific community. That, and I, w- I wish I had time to get into the studies, but we've done that in the past. These are newer studies that just came out in the last week that were just published. And I'm telling you guys, you need to teach your children that they're loved by God and, and that they're valuable to him. Jesus said that you know, uh, his, his disciples you know, are more valuable to uh, uh, the Father than many sparrows. So yes, God so loved you that he gave his son. But he didn't give his son because you are a good person. He values you because he made you in his image and he cares about you because of who he is. Amen? Everything's come from him. So you do need to teach, yes, God loves... And guess what? That's what kids need to know, that God does love them, that he cares about them, but they also need to know that, guess what? It's wrong to steal and cheat and lie and kill. And God's a holy God. And he is God and you are not. And he will judge you for those things. And you need to turn from those things. So they need to get appropriate understanding of what's going on beyond the little box where they're taught these lies. They need to be taught the truth that there is a God outside the box that made you. You didn't make yourself. You answer to him. And you'll stand before him and give an account. And he cares about you deeply. He loves you deeply, but you need to turn to him. You need to follow him. So, you know, I'm telling you right now, guys, it's only going to get worse because the heart is getting worse, because people are being taught that evil is okay and they're still good and they can think that they're good people even though they're ripping off people and stealing. But we know it's not good. We know the suffering that's going on with millions of people right now because other people, what they've done with their money and, and in the government and in what have you, and we know that that's not good, we, and everybody knows that, because people are able to recognize good and evil when it affects them, but they don't want to recognize it when they're doing it. That's the problem, and that's why we need to share the gospel with people. That's why we need to share with people uh, the need uh, to be saved. It was the man in the temple. Two men were in the temple. Jesus said one of them had a really high self-esteem. He was saying, man, I fast and I I pray, you know, and, you know, I give to the poor. I'm such a good guy. And the other guy recognized he was a sinner. And he beat his chest and didn't even look up and says, God, have mercy on me. I'm a sinner. He prayed for mercy. And Jesus said, which one of the two left right with God? And those who was questioning answered and said, the guy who beat his chest, Jesus said, you've answered correctly. In other words, we need to be humble And not think that we're great, but recognize that we fall short radically of God's glory every day and that we need to depend upon his mercy and his love. Amen? And humble ourselves before God. And when you look at the problem, now I want you, 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 we have to assess the problem which we've done. The reason people's feet run rapidly to evil. And one of the verses in the scripture says, that the wicked man says in his heart there's no God, so he can do his evil abominations or his abominations. In other words, it's not an intellectual thing. Intellectually, there's obviously a designer. But people want to deny the designer of the universe because they want to do evil, the Bible says. They want to do their own thing. It's a heart condition, you see. It's about where the heart is at. And we need to recognize that's the problem. And we also need to recognize that that problem has been compounded because in our nation... They've been getting taught in the schools and through movies and a lot of the music and Hollywood crowd that there's no rules you really have to go by. You can make them up, and you're really a good person even when you're doing evil. And they're being taught in the schools that, hey, there's really, you know, at least uh, tacitly, there's really no creator. uh, uh, And guess what? You can think really, you should think really highly of yourselves. The problem in the world is because people don't think they're hot. People don't have a high enough self-esteem. So you put all that together, and there's a lot more than that, because the Bible says we're wrestling against these spiritual forces. You know, there's a lot going on, okay? There's powerful forces in the governments and what have you. So we need to recognize and say, okay, wait a minute, man. I wasn't made by the government. I wasn't made by the government schools. I was made by the creator. And the government schools aren't going to be there when I die, right? And Hollywood crowd's not going to come to my funeral, and they're not going to arbitrate the destiny of my eternal, eternal soul. God is. Amen? For every one of us. 
And it's him that we need to live for, amen? It's him that we need to fear. We need to do good. We need to, be, do, we need to pay our taxes, you know? We need to uh, do good to the, you know, uh, uh, obey the government, unless it, the government, what? Disobeys God. And I think it's going to get worse and worse. The Bible is very clear that it will. So what about our feet? What direction should our feet be going in then? Well, our feet, the Bible says in Psalm 119, verse 59, the psalmist said, I've turned my feet toward your testimonies. We need to turn our feet to God's word. Not to the voice of scoffers, as we read in Proverbs 1, to run with them to shed blood. But Psalm 119, 59 says, to turn our feet toward what? God's testimonies, God's word. And I love it in Ephesians 6 when it says, be strong in the Lord and the power of his might and to put on the whole armor of God that you may be able to stand against the wiles of the, the devil. And, and he talks about the armor, you know, the, the breastplate of righteousness and putting on the helmet of salvation and taking the sword of the spirit, which is the word of God and the shield of faith whereby you may extinguish all the fiery darts, the evil one and the belt of truth. But one piece of armor that I find interesting among all of them, and they're all interesting, but is the feet prepared with the gospel of peace. Our feet need to turn to his testimonies, his word. Then we're supposed to obey his word, and that means we're supposed to bring the gospel of peace. Our feet, your feet, don't, aren't, shouldn't be running rapidly to evil. They should be running where? To his what? Word, his truth. And then where? Your feet are supposed to be clothed with the preparation of the gospel of peace in Ephesians 6. That means that you, your feet are, when you wake up in the morning, it's not just your physical shoes you put on, but spiritually, metaphorically, you say, you know what? I want to make sure I share the gospel today in some way. I want to make sure I share the gospel with my life and the example that I am before my family, before my neighbors, before people at school or before people at work. I want to share, I want to go in that direction. I want to share it with my mouth. God, give me opportunity. God, bring forth divine appointments. I pray, I, I, I try to pray. God, give me divine appointments. Open up, uh, the, you know, opportunities for me to share with people. And it seems like whenever I'm, boom, you know, it's crazy. I mean, last week, Lisa and I <clears throat> were in Moore Park and we had a, a meeting we, we, have a, we live in a house. We rent a house that's like rat infested. My wife's been begging me for years and years and years to rent another house. And, and uh, I always say, same with church. Everyone wants to move different times. I'm always the one, the last guy. Okay. You know, when it, okay, I can see now we need to. Well, we probably need to for some time. I've, I've killed probably 100 rats at my house. I'm not kidding with all kinds of devices. I live by a wash and they just keep coming up because I got dogs. You got to feed dogs. They don't always eat all their food. And you know, and we have a nice attic and nice office we built in there that, where they live right above me at times. I hear them going around like, oh, Lord God. The best method is you get a pellet gun and you go out there in the dark and you strap a flashlight on it and you just wait till you hear and you go, Pfft. I don't do that method. Dave Owens used to do that method, but I'd rather shoot an elk, man, personally. But <laughs> that sounds kind of fun, man, when you live, when they, never mind. <laughs> Pretty crazy. Anyway, uh, <clears throat> so we're sitting down with a guy, and uh, <clears throat> I'm like, okay, well, because I, I like my rent, and it's gone up, and it keeps going up and up. She keeps running, oh, that's true. And I figure, my, okay, my car payment's over in a few months, and it's going to be the same when my car payment's over in three months, as it is here pretty much. Okay, so guess what? I'm talking to this guy, but I'm still, Lord, I want to have my attendance. I want to be a witness, you know? And <clears throat> actually, I'm talking to his wife because he wasn't there yet, you know? And as we're talking, my wife and I are there, you know, signing the papers. He comes and he goes, or a guy comes in from French, France. And, and he's got the French accent and all. And the French get a bad rap. Okay, I know there's some French people like American people that need help. Amen? But this guy was so sweet. And he was like a uh, you know, 30-year-old kid. He was just lit up. He's just like, and he, you know, he's, he's coaching over at, uh, in the past at Moore Park, I think, in the football team. And he's like that really nice guy. And we're, he just came in. And he, was look, he just got back from France. And he was going to stay in France, but he ended up coming back. And some things happened. And he, he's, ta- he's talking to her, saying his, asking for her husband, because he's French too, and they know each other, and, and uh, our friends, and he's not there. And, and then he starts to say something. He looks at us. He goes, I don't know if you guys have a strong belief in God or not. 
I go, okay. I go, yeah, we do. And he goes, I just got saved, you know? I just came to Jesus. And I'm like, well, praise the Lord. I mean, I've never been in that office in my life, and he just got from, off a plane from France, and there he is, you know, what, a couple weeks earlier, three days earlier, or a week, I don't know how long he's been in town. And we had this great talk. And it just went, and, and at the same time, he was going through something. And my wife runs out, she brings back a bunch of videos on different things. One of them was they sold their souls for rock and roll, one of our videos we made. And she goes, and he goes, I need this. And I can't tell you the details, but he took me aside and he told me why that was the perfect thing to give him at that time because of something that's happening in his life. And it was a divine appointment. And I thought, you know what, God, you were just so good. The guy, this guy was just walking in the middle of our meeting and just leave, and he doesn't even live here. I think he lives in Pasadena, you know? So, I mean, God's always doing things like that. I didn't get to share, have to share the gospel. Oh, I did, because I shared the gospel with the lady. Then it opened up the door. He left, and then for an hour we talked about the gospel with her. And nice gal, you know, and she said she's been seeking God lately. And I thought, praise the Lord, really sweet gal, you know, and her husband's sweet. And it's just, it was a great day. I left there thinking, man, praise God, you know. You always do the most incredible things, but our feet should be prepared with the gospel of peace. We should be looking for opportunities, praying for opportunities. I mean, this Friday, you know, I'm going I'm to be going out. I can, uh, me and a few other people, a couple other people talked a couple weeks ago, Marcy, David, and David, David, about going together to Friday night witnessing. Uh, this Friday is the date we're going. We've been talking about it for three weeks. And a lot of people go out there every Friday or every other Friday or what have you. And, and what an opportunity that is, you know? To share the gospel. And so you just want to make sure that, you're, that, that that's what your life is about, is getting the good news to people. And it's not, I'm not saying you got to go out there. It says to go everywhere. But go somewhere. Do something. Pray. You know? Support uh, the ministry of gospel financially. I mean, there's all kinds. Of, buy someone a Bible. You know? How did you get saved? Somebody put time and talent and treasure into getting the gospel to you. Amen? And Paul says we are debtors to all men. You know, because we shouldn't be saved. And you know what? I love a verse we quote a lot. I just think it's a great verse, you know, because it makes it real clear to people. Uh, in Pro, in uh, Romans ten thirteen, it says that whoever calls upon the name of the Lord shall be what? Saved. But then I like what Paul says after that, that we don't quote so much, but, and we don't read so much, but it's very powerful because he says, whoever calls upon the name of the Lord shall be saved. But he said, but how can they call upon whom they have not believed in? And how can they believe in one that they've not heard of? And how can they hear if there's no one to preach to them? And how can one preach unless he's sent? In other words, we need to send out. We need to go out. So you say, go. Send out preachers so people could hear. And so they can believe. And so they can call upon the one they believed upon. Amen. And be saved. And then the very next verse, that's verse 14. Then verse 15, I love it. Paul says, it is written. How beautiful. On the mountains are the feet of those who bring good news. The name of this message is how to have beautiful feet. I know the verse we're looking at is feet that run rapidly to evil, but we want to have beautiful feet, amen? How beautiful on the mountains are the feet of those who bring good news. That's powerful. How beautiful on the mountains are the feet of those who bring good news. Now, that verse always tripped me out. I know the meaning, but I was, I was running the other day, and I was running. We, had helped, we helped Kelly move yesterday, Kelly Locke. She's been staying at her house for months, and she got back from her missionary trip of sharing the good news for the last year or whatever it was, six months, over uh, in Israel. But she was sharing, they were sharing among the Arab people and, and the Jewish people. And she got back, and... And she, now she's got another place. So I, I got up kind of early to go running in the hills. And, and I brought a memory verse with me on sharing the good news, on the gospel, you know. Uh, in fact, the verse I quoted, verses 13 and 14, I wanted that in my heart. Uh, I, I've had 13 down, but 14 and 15, which I quoted you, I wanted that in my heart, you know. And I, and I ran with that. And it was there I was able to meditate and think about and contemplate and pray and seek the Lord about the meaning of that verse more. And, I, and it just opened up to me just in a beautiful way especially when I was on my way back. And, uh, and it wasn't one of those walk, run, you know, hike trips. It was a run, run trip because I didn't want to be late for Kelly's move, you know. But still, the Lord hit me with some heavy, heavy things because it was, because um, you know what, I'm one of those guys where I don't find feet the most attractive part of people's anatomy. When we think about it, usually it's probably the most unattractive part of people's anatomy, you know. Uh, 
But how beautiful on the mountains are the feet of those who bring good news. It's not talking about people's physical feet. It's talking about everyone's feet who brings good news. And he didn't say how beautiful in the upper room are the feet of the disciples. Why? Because the disciples were arguing about who was the greatest. And they were refusing to wash each other's feet. Because usually somebody would, the first per, a servant would wash everybody's feet or the first person to a, a home or room would wash everybody else's feet if there was no servant there. And they were arguing about who was the greatest. So I believe, and they had dirty feet. We know that because Jesus had to wash them himself. And it doesn't say their feet were beautiful because their feet represented selfishness, man. And what was beautiful there was when Jesus got down on his hands and knees and washed their feet and said, I've come to serve and I've given you an example. Happy are you if you do likewise. Amen? Not about self, about loving God, about serving him. But the beautiful feet are the mountains. Amen? Sharing the gospel. And as I was running, I was thinking these thoughts. I was like, Lord, you know, but because I thought, man, I just pictured, because keep in mind, your feet get really dirty in, you know, the ancient land of Israel. They had no paved roads, guys. They didn't have, uh, you know, bathrooms you could just go into and wash along the way and clean up, pull into an APM, PM if you're on a far drive. And then you're walking for miles. And if you're in the mountains, the roads are worse and your feet would get dirtier. So we're not talking about beautiful feet physically. How beautiful on the mountains are the feet of those who bring good news. In fact, those feet are beautiful because they represent the heart of one who's forsaken self to bring the good news of salvation to keep you out of hell and travel for miles to do it. I mean, I think of Paul's feet. I think of Jesus' feet. They were all over the place. You know, Paul said he went through all kinds of hardships. You know, he was, he was beaten over and over again, more than once with rods, you know, shipwrecked, in famine. Went, he traversed everywhere, all over the place. He was, he was stones were thrown at, him, thrown at him. He was stoned to death and left for dead. He lived through it. He went all over the place. So did Jesus. If you looked at their feet, beautiful. Praise God, man. If I'm on a mountaintop and Paul's been through all that and he comes and brings me the gospel, the good news, that I could be forgiven of my sins, I could be right with God and know that if I die this very day, I'll be right with God. What good news that is, amen? Amen. And you know what? What beautiful feet you have, Paul, that did all that work to get to me. Beautiful feet, Paul. And I don't care, man. Someone's feet might be, you know, they could be like the ugliest physical specimens you've ever seen and and have mountains of toe jam between them when they get up there and and ingrown toenails, every one of them, and pus coming out and blood because of all the treks they did. But you know what? Hey, you guys are better off. This isn't right before lunch, okay? Next service, they're in trouble, right? But they could be just infected and everything else. And guess what? Those are beautiful feet, man, because all they went through all that to bring the gospel to me. It's a person that loves God, that loves the lost. Amen? That's a caring person. And how beautiful the mountains are the feet of those who bring good news. I'll tell you what, if you have a family and there's people that have an infection, they're dying, and all of a sudden someone traveled for miles through rain and sleet and snow and hardship and, and danger and toil, and they brought penicillin for your children who were dying, you'd say, wow, how beautiful your feet are. God God works in incredible ways. How much more beautiful when someone brings you the gospel that keeps you out of hell than penicillin, amen? Forever. You know, I was talking to Lenny, and we're talking, you know, oh, by the way, what was one of the songs today? Go tell it on the what? Mountain. I did not talk to Dean, okay? Uh, this happened. God does that a lot. You know, I haven't done that song in how long? You know? And uh, I thought, wow, that's my message is how to have beautiful feet. You want to have beautiful feet? Serve Jesus, man. Share the gospel. Reach out to the lost. Put your gospel shoes on. And you know what? This is a two-part message like the last one as far as on the specific thing that God hates. The first one, we talked about, what God, which is today, we talked about what God hates. But I wanted to talk to you what he wants, what he loves. They're beautiful. He sees your feet as beautiful if you're sharing the gospel. And next week we'll emphasize not the feet that run rapidly to evil, but next week we're going to have a full study on sharing the gospel. And uh, that's one, don't say, oh, you know what? Don't run your feet. 
away from the Lord, say, you know what? Look forward to it, amen? Because the Bible says that God's given apostles, prophets, evangelists, pastors, and teachers for the perfecting of the saints for the work of the ministry. And the saints aren't people that die that they say years later we make them a saint. No, the letters of the New Testament are written to the saints. They're living people. They're the people that serve God. Saint doesn't mean you're a special Christian. Saint means you are a Christian. The word hagias means one that's been separated to God. And it's addressed to the saints. So many of the books is to the, because you're either a saint or you're a ain't. You know, you're one or the other. You know, and God says that the work of the, that pastors are supposed to equip the saints for the what? Work of the ministry. And that's what, you know, next week we'll be talking about how we have an obligation to fulfill the Great Commission. Jesus commanded all of us to go. And he's given all of us, he says, every one of us, he said, uh, Paul said, has a ministry of reconciliation. Amen? So I look forward to next week. But I'll tell you what. Can we be sure in our hearts that we will not use our feet to run rapidly to evil? Amen? But that we will prepare our feet with the gospel of peace. Amen? And that we will have beautiful feet because we'll use our feet to share the gospel with the lost. Amen? Amen? And you say, well, I don't know exactly. Next week, amen. And this week, we know right now, just pray, God, use me. And pray that God would give you a burning desire to see people saved, a burden for the lost, amen. Just pray that. Say, God, help me to see the state people are in. And, and help me to get my eyes off of myself and, and, and trying to, you know, make myself happy with things and the things that, and, and there's a, to be undistracted, but filled with your Holy Spirit and your love, and focused on your word. Help me turn my testimonies to your word and not let the world choke it out, and then obey your word to go into all the world to save the gospel with the lost. Amen? Praise God. I mean, how many people did we have go to the Mexico trip to Mexico? It was almost 100 people. And there was so much joy there, and how beautiful your feet were to those people in Mexico, all those poor people that we brought things to, that we shared with, that we loved. You know? And we've had a lot of trips, and we'll have more. But... Father, we pray right now in your son's name that you will prepare our feet with the gospel of peace and that you would help us obey your command to prepare our feet with the gospel of peace and that we would indeed take it to the mountains. We'd take it, as Jesus said, go into all the world and preach the gospel to every creature. As he said, Father, uh, to preach the gospel in Jerusalem and Judea and the uttermost parts of the earth. Father, we pray in your son's name that we would take the gospel of the lost so they would be saved, so they wouldn't have to face eternity in hell forever because of their sins. And we pray, Father, if there's anybody here or anybody watching on television or hearing on the internet or by CD that's been given to them, that they would know that you do love them, that you do care about them, but that they're in a heap of trouble if they haven't been forgiven, if they're running from you and rebellious and doing their own thing, that they would be convicted of their sin and they would know that you have provided a remedy for their sin. That your son, the Lord Jesus Christ said, I've come to seek and save that which is lost. And he said, I've come to give my life a ransom for many. As we approach Christmas, Father, celebrating the birth of Christ, that they would understand the reason he came, as Paul said, was to save sinners. That they know that they could be saved if they simply turn to him right now from their sin into him and say, God, have mercy on me. I'm a sinner. Forgive me. Come into my life. In Jesus' name. Amen. Praise God. Let's pass out the cup and the bread.
my heart And I will search for yours Jesus, take my life and lead me on Lord, you have my heart I will search for yours Let me be to you a sacrifice feet are feet that have been worn because of sharing the gospel and because of loving us and when I think of uh, service to the Lord service to the Father in heaven and, and sacrifice you know and the limits that people will go well I think of first and foremost the Son of God Jesus Christ amen becoming a man you know leaving his heaven man leaving the palace in heaven and all the worship that he was receiving from the angels. Instead of wiping us out in the incarnation, the first real Christmas morning, you know, becoming a man, being born into this world to save sinners, to live a horrible death, to go to great limits for 33 years to live a perfect life, but to be mocked, to be hated, rejected, beaten, scorned, you know, and all the stuff he went through, beard ripped out, all that, nailed to the cross you know he, he went through a lot he came a long way to reach us amen he went through a lot to save us and he said the father God has anointed me with the Holy Spirit to preach the gospel that's what it's about and now when I look at his feet in heaven and I see that they're not they're, the feet that he has are human feet that he's been resurrected but he still has what he still has the scars in those feet he told Thomas stick your finger in my fingers plural in my side there's probably a bit of a hole there still in both of his feet healed over with some skin no doubt but the holes are there and those are going to be the most beautiful feet I'll ever see because of the holes, you see. And they'll be the most beautiful feet that you ever see. And we have beautiful feet by following in his footsteps. Amen. Father, we thank you. And as we think of his beautiful feet, Father, we hold the bread and the cup, which are so beautiful, Father. Communion is so beautiful, Lord, because it represents his heart and shows what he did on the cross and giving his body Without sin, we hold this bread, Father. Without leaven, representing his body, who gave himself for our sin so we could be saved. We partake of it in Jesus' name. And Father, we think of the uh, cup and how beautiful it is. The beautiful fruit of the vine, Father. And the new fruit of the vine, Father, without alcohol in it, Father, unleavened. No leaven or yeast in this, Lord, even as his blood was without sin and so precious. He poured it out for us on Calvary's cross. We partake of the cup in Jesus' name. In thanksgiving. Amen. Let's turn our hearts toward his testimonies. Amen. And let's turn our feet toward our testimonies. And let's turn our hearts and our feet to the mountains where the lost are. Amen. We have a short time, guys. Let's get busy for Jesus. Amen.
Let's make one of our resolutions for this next year, preaching the gospel. Father, we thank you. We praise you. We love you. We glorify you. You are the great and mighty and almighty God. Praise your name. Hallelujah.